I'm sort of looking at you defining yourself as a crisis leader. Um, you came into office as this forward-looking leader with concrete policy plans around priorities like roads and education, but starting really with the cold crisis in January of 2019 and up through the coronavirus crisis today, you've had to put those things on the back burner um, and put out sort of fire after fire. Um, is there anything in your background that prepared you for that experience? And what, what, what's a crisis that you managed before you were governor? I think it's funny that you said I came in with concrete plans because I literally had concrete plans for concrete. Um, and we're still moving forward on those. But no, I appreciate the nature of the question. I think that um, nothing can prepare you for a global pandemic. I mean, no one has lived through something like this. You know, this is a moment where all of us leaders are being tested and having to do things we never fathomed. I'll say one of the great things that I've come to appreciate is the relationships that I've built in a very short amount of time with my fellow governors. Uh, it's really important to maintain perspective when so much of the world is coming at you so fast and you're making decisions that really are, are life and death. We're dealing with a you know 100 year pandemic event that has ravaged the globe, a 500 year flooding event, a economic recession bigger than than anyone's dealt with since the Great Depression. Um, and on top of it, you know, righteous civil unrest around policing. I mean, this is, in any circumstance, one of those things would, it, it, you know, require your complete attention. And yet we're dealing with all four of them at the same. So I don't know that there's some point that I can tell you trained me or got me prepared for this. I'll just say, you know, in early in my life, um, or it's early now, it, but when I was 29, my mom was sick with brain cancer. I had just had a baby. I was, had started a new job. I was newly married. You know, balancing a lot of that and, and keeping perspective was a, a skill that I had to hone. And I know people across our, our country deal with a lot harder stuff than even that. But it taught me to be thinking about 100 yards down the field, but focusing on the next five. And I think that's a skill that I've really um, utilized throughout this crisis. What was going back to March, um, what was going through your mind when you realized that um, you'd have to declare a, a state of emergency around this uh, disease that I don't even think was recognized as a pandemic yet, yet at that point? So, you know, it's interesting. My sister had H1N1. And so she was one of the first people to really kind of start ringing the alarm bells. I mean, back during the holidays, which was very early compared to our, you know, our national leadership and certainly the states. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, she was already very worried, having lived through, you know, what was a, um, a crisis similar to this. Now, I mean, this dwarfs anything, of course. But um, I think that those early days, we'd already set up the State Emergency Operations Center before our first cases came. We'd set up our state lab, thanks to Dr. Caldoun, who said, we, we got to start getting serious and preparing. This is coming. It's not a question of if, but a question of when. Uh, so those first two cases on March 10th, uh, which was also the day of our primary, I mean, literally pivoted from watching returns to going down to the State Emergency Operations Center and and conducting you know, um, the effort uh, essentially every single minute of every day since then. It's, um, I think you know, the, the magnitude of how hard we were hit as early as we were was something that um, was, was truly unique. We were the 10th largest state in the nation and yet we had the third highest number of deaths for many weeks on end, third highest number of cases. And so we had to be really aggressive. And I think the thing that I'm really grateful for is the phenomenal leadership um, in Dr. Caldoun, DHHS, University of Michigan Public Health, and um, the access that I have to national epidemiology experts um, has helped me you know, every step of the way and informed the work that we've done. When you think about what your goals were coming into office, um, in January of 2019. Uh, how difficult was it for you to shift your thinking from uh, improvements and uh, ways you could improve the experience of Michiganders to literally just keeping people alive? 
So the, the thing about this crisis is while it has consumed me and the executive office um, and a number of different departments at different, in different ways across state government, is we still have to do our job. Um, we still have to make sure that Eagle is you know, overseeing uh, water quality across the state of Michigan. We still have to make sure that uh, Heidi Washington and the Department of Corrections is doing what they need to do um, in terms of our, our correction system, our, our criminal justice system. So you can't just stop everything and focus, although there's, it's tempting to do that because the um, stakes are so high. So we've been able, I think, because I've got a, a wonderful team, so smart. I was talking to Rachel Eubanks, our state treasurer, the other day, and she said, you know, treasury hasn't missed a beat. In fact, they've gotten more productive working remotely this way. So I think that there are maybe long-term improvements and lessons that we will take out of this that will perhaps inform a lot of the work that we do in the future. But of course, I'd love to just be focusing on fixing the damn roads. Uh, but right now, we've got to think about that and a lot of other stuff that we're confronting every day. You're looking, um, you know, at a potentially three billion dollar budget deficit next year, um, record unemployment. Uh, do you think it's possible to to fix the roads this term? I do, and we're going to. <laughs> I mean, we won't fix every road that I had intended. If we had taken the action that I uh, introduced last year, we'd be in a much stronger position. But of course, the Republican-led legislature wouldn't wouldn't help on the issue that was most important to people in our state. So I'm going it alone, and we're going to fix a lot of the state roads. But local roads are still going to be in bad shape until we get a legislature that will work to make this priority a reality. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we you know know how to chew gum and walk at the same time. We've got to continue to move forward in terms of keeping people safe, getting people back to work. We've got to move forward in terms of educating our children. And so this fourth supplemental that we are expecting in the next couple of weeks to come out of the United States Senate and get um, approved at the House and, and back to uh, the, the president's desk, I'm hoping that that gets done because a lot of the work that we need to do as states, and not this isn't unique to Michigan, uh, is relying on them giving us the kind of resources to do it right. But that systemic road funding fix that would also fix local roads, you think that's still on the table for this term for you? For the term, yes. Uh, for this current legislature, no. <laughs> if I'm just being, you know, if I'm being totally blunt, maybe they will have some courage when they come back after the election. Uh, but I've been told time and time again that they care about this, they want to do something, but you know, at this juncture, I've not seen any real seriousness in terms of alternatives to this, the plan that I put on the table last year. And that's why I'm, I'm moving forward with the bonding. What's been the hardest moment for you as you've navigated this crisis? Well, I've had, I've had a number of hard moments. You know, I lost a very dear friend to COVID-19 and, um, you know, it, it, I'm so focused on doing, you know, doing the next right thing. And every once in a while when I actually, you know, get an opportunity to exercise, it'll kind of hit me. And um, when Morris Hood died, I think that was, um, that was a tough moment. Um, when, when do you see, I know you said you're walking and chewing gum at the same time here, um, but when do you see being able to get back to some of your po policy goals and put those at the forefront um, as opposed to dealing with the day-to-day -day fires that keep popping up here? Well, so, you know, right now in 496, they're doing one of the road projects that is a part of the bonding, and I'm glad to see that continuing to move forward. Uh, as we have made decisions, even negotiating with the legislature now on, on you know, fixing the current fiscal year, uh, we are prioritizing uh, wrapping our kids with the kind of supports they're going to need in education. Is there enough resources there right now? No, but that's why this fourth supplemental could really give us the chance to ensure that as we um, contemplate returning to school, that we've got all of the wraparounds that our kids are gonna need. So it's my hope that we can continue to make progress on those fundamental pieces of the budget. Uh, and, and part of my, my agenda that I ran on and that, that I've set you know, in terms of writing that budget and um, the course that we've set, but we also are gonna to continue to have to battle COVID-19. And so that's why I think the masking 
uh, mandate. I know, you know, it's, it's just so important. It's a simple act that every one of us can take that can drive our numbers down and put us in a stronger position to get kids back in school and to keep our economy moving forward. It's not about politics. Um, Republican governors are doing the same thing. It's simply about keeping people safe and, and driving these numbers down. And um, that's, that's gotta be a centerpiece of everything we're doing on top of all the other things.